Dzień dobry Państwu, witam serdecznie. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the debate related to the elections in the US and its impact, its implication for Europe and for Poland perhaps. My name is Bartosz Węglaczek. I will have the pleasure to moderate, to facilitate this debate and now I'll... Uh, I can stick to English, but if you prefer, there's, there's translation for you. Um, we have three panelists today. Let me start with the left, Judy Dempsey. Judy Dempsey is a long-time journalist and uh, a former uh, FT correspondent to Poland in, uh, in very interesting times. And the, time, the interesting times are back. And you are now based in Brussels. And, and I'm sorry, in Berlin. And you quit journalism. I'm back. <laughs> Again. Okay, you're back to the journalism, which is good for us, and thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Thank you for having me. Thank and uh, on my right, Chris Steinegger, uh, the former Kansas State Senator and the former supporter of the Democratic Party who switched to Republican Party, and I wonder if you'll switch back to the <laughs> Democratic Party this, this campaign, and we'll ask you about this. And here, my, uh, the, uh, uh, Director Marcin Zaborowski, Director of SIPA, thank you so much for having me here, and former Director of PISM, uh, Polski Institut Spraw Międzynarodowych. So let me... I'm sorry for, for doing this, but let me start with Chris. And I know you want to make, no, I'm sorry, the director wants to make some opening remarks. Everybody does. <laughs> Everybody wants to make, uh, except for me, maybe. No, but just for, the, for the procedural reasons, I mean, uh, uh, since this, is, uh, this, this particular panel is under the banner of SIPA, Center for European Policy Analysis, just by, uh, by, by uh, procedural terms, I just have to say a few uh, words of thank you to those who enabled uh, this panel in particular the Embassy of the United States in Warsaw, who've been a, a strong supporter of uh, uh, um, us meeting up uh, together. And uh, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Madura, who is with us, taking pictures somewhere here. Oh yeah, he's here. Uh, he's been a, um, a, a great source of help in, uh, in allowing us to meet. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank Business Alert, it's an, uh, our uh, uh, partner, our media partner, and I would like to thank Mr. Venglarczyk for uh, accepting this invitation and um, moderating this panel. And of course, I'd like to thank our participants to, uh, to come and travel from afar and meeting us here. So let's switch to Chris, and I, want, I know you want to make some opening remarks, and I wonder if you can make opening remarks about how it's possible for the Republican Party to choose Donald Trump as your candidate. And, and how you will vote for him, because that's the most interesting part. I think. Well, good morning, uh, Dobry Virginia. My name is Chris Steiniger, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be in Poland on my fourth trip here. Um, I want to explain my style uh, and what my mission today is to help you understand America, not as it's presented by uh, the media, not as it's thought of as by the people in Washington, but more from the American heartland and more from middle class, working class people. Um, although I've been in politics many, many years, uh, when I've traveled abroad, I find that foreign audiences, you know, all, all you can know, know about us is what's presented via television, newspaper, or maybe if you've traveled there and you know a little bit about it. But most of us, it's filtered through you know, politicians, bureaucrats, the political staff, journalists, etc. most of whom are in Washington, D.C. America is a huge country. Washington is a small city. And I want you to know what the view and feelings about common Americans are, not the political elite, not the people in Washington, but the other 99% of us. So that's my job today, and this is my style of answering your questions. I've been active in both parties, Democrat and Republican. Uh, today, I will try and give you mostly neutral view uh, of what the people are thinking. Uh, I am a Republican, so I have my bias. Um, to answer the question about Trump, he was not my first choice, not even my fifth choice originally. I was supporting Jeb Bush. He dropped out. I switched to Marco Rubio uh, because I thought he was a good compromise candidate. He dropped out. Uh, after that, I was uh, well, kind of liking John Kasich, but he never had a chance. So now, as a Republican, we're all, all of us Republicans, we're, we're stuck with Donald Trump, and we just have to manage as best we can to try and we're, most Republicans in the end will vote for Trump, uh, hoping 
you know, even if we don't like the guy, but the choice will be, do we continue on with Democrat policies or do we try and at least move the country a bit more uh, towards the center and in a better future? So I will, I will support the Republican nominee uh, in November. Uh, it's not my best choice, but it's the only choice I have and we have to work with it. Jody, let me let me ask you, and uh, as a journalist, can you explain to us what happened with, in the U.S. politics? Because if if anybody asked me half a year ago, and I did it publicly, I said Donald Trump doesn't stand a chance to get the nomination. And but I'm not the only one. I think all the journalists thought so, and all the political scientists and and all the politicians that I talked to in Washington, nobody gave him a chance. What happened? Thank you for. Asking me this Easy very, question, very, yes. very complicated question. Short, I, think Chris, short I think Chris touched on it, um, the gap between the Washington political elite and lobby and what's happening in the rest of the country. And um, I'm not American, and but as a European, uh, the implications of the outcome of, of, the, of the presidential campaign has an enormous impact on Europe. But just very briefly, I think what is happening in America and what has given rise to Trumpism is similar to what is happening in Europe, to populist movements um, fueled by disappointment, fueled by um, the, the fact that maybe globalization has left them down, fueled by the gap between the decision makers and the elites and the normal public, and maybe this sense of, of powerlessness, which is no longer now unique to, the, to, the, to those who are actually, Chris, um, supporting Sanders as well. I mean, there are similarities in some ways between Sanders and, and Trump, this kind of, um, this kind of reaching out to very, reaching out to a different section, reaching out to the same Americans, but Americans who feel that they haven't been listened to, and um, it's somehow um, you do get this, uh, not uh, this kind of similarity in Europe. This is the first point, and Chris, I'd be interested in what you think of the other point, is that the kind of. Um, Post Second World War party system in America um, is in decline, as it is in decline in Europe. The big political parties of the Social Democrats and the Conservatives, left and right in, in Europe, are now, in, for want of a better term, pretty well imploding uh, in response to. Uh, being out of touch, in response to a younger generation, in response to the social media, and in response to the fact that expectations are no longer what they used to be, particularly for those uh, middle class and the younger generation, that they are not going to get what their parents had, security of jobs, especially in Europe, and they are not going to traditionally vote uh, for those parties that their parents did. So we're getting shifts, and I do actually, if you talk about a transatlantic relationship, I do actually see similarities now, what's happening in the United States and what's happening in Europe in terms of the traditional parties and the diminishing expectations of, of certain uh, generations. Uh, Director Zaborowski, do you do you see the similarities between what's happening in the U.S. politics and European politics, and do you think it's the same wave as Judy mentioned of people who are not satisfied with the present system? They're looking for let's a third way. Let's call it. I'm, I'm, I know this is the British British expression, British politics, uh, but but it is in a sense a third way. Uh, I do. I, I think that uh, you, you see it um, really everywhere in, within the Western Hemisphere. Um, so you, you see Brexiters in the UK, uh, you see the rise of discontent in France with the rise of the National Front. Uh, in uh, Germany you have AFP now getting 15% of support. Uh, so uh, that would be unthinkable, you know, only a few years ago, but, uh, and, and openly, not, not just Eurosceptic, but anti-immigrant party. That, that's unusual in Germany, really. Uh, certain taboos have been, uh, have been broken, and we see that in Central and Eastern Europe, frankly. Uh, we see, you know, uh, radical populist parties coming to power uh, and openly questioning some key fundamentals of liberal democracy. Um, now, the reason for that being 
uh, I, I think if I if I was to respond to that in in a, uh, a decisive way, they, uh, perhaps I could deserve a Nobel Prize or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, so we, we, there's something happening here that we we are only trying to grasp to understand. I think, uh, and I would say, uh, you know, the indeed the impact of globalization is such that. Uh, there are growing divisions between those who are economic gainers yeah. and those who are economic losers. And uh, it's not just that people are becoming uh, poorer, but it's just that uh, some people are trapped and uh, their chances to move out from where they are uh, are you know, not, not great. And at the same time, they are very well aware of their neighbors and the other neighbors getting richer and wealthier. Um, and, and I think that this is, this is really a, a seed of discontent. Like in this country, for example, uh, uh, we had um, eight years of economic growth and you'd have expected that after eight years of economic growth in the conditions of the rest of the world, of the Western world, not doing as well as this country, uh, well, uh, there would be some kind of political reward. Well, that wasn't the case. What eventually happened is that people uh, voted for change uh, because uh, divisions have grown within the uh, society and, uh, and there was a group of people who couldn't move from where they were. Um, uh, so that's part of the response. Um, I don't want to be long-winded, but I mean, we, we, we started to talk a little bit about the impact of, uh, um, you know, the social space media on, on, on what is happening. And of course, you know, we, we wouldn't be blaming, you know, media for these developments, but I mean, but we live in the uh, age of constant, uh, immediate uh, communication, uh, which means that anybody could become a journalist, uh, and the most populist idea can immediately find its, uh, its, its, uh, its way into, to appear into the space. Uh, and then suddenly you'd find out that in this country most people would support capital punishment, for example. Uh, or you'd find out that most people don't want refugees to come here. Uh, and in the past, without social media there, if somebody came up with a, a, a strong populist idea that would be filtered through one editor, second editor, and then maybe it would somehow appear in the New York Times in some measured way, yeah? that is no longer the case now. And that has impact on politicians who themselves uh, are, I've never seen politicians so driven by the, by, by the sense of just winning. Mm. They just want to win. Mm. They don't care about, you know, what principles, how. They just want to get there. Um, and I think that the, you know, the impact of social media and all of that is uh, regrettably uh, rather damaging to the quality of public life. Ja tylko powiem, jakbyście Państwo chcieli zadać pytanie, to bardzo proszę. Ladies and gentlemen, if you feel like asking a question, then please go ahead so that we can actually direct this discussion where you would like it to go. Um, once you have a question, please, uh, uh, please put your hand up and I will pass the microphone to you so that you can ask the question. Uh, we mentioned that there are similarities between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in a sense that they're both candidates of an anger of the people. So what happened in the Republican Party and what didn't happen after the last elections four years ago, lost by the Republican Party? There was a reform plan by, by the people who run the party that was supposed to happen. It didn't happen. All the establishment candidates were swept away and Donald Trump, who Explain to me as well how it's possible for Donald Trump to represent people who are not doing well and the people that we mentioned that, they're, they're, that they think that they're uh, left behind. How can they be represented by a guy who's definitely not left behind, who's the wealthiest guy in America? I think you're asking maybe two or three questions in one question, so I'll do my best. Um, Populism, populism is, is alive and well in the United States and in Europe, I, I certainly agree. I don't think it's a bad thing. 
And I, I do worry sometimes that people who are populist oriented in Europe seem to, seem to be getting labeled as Nazis or neo-Nazi, and maybe some of there are those people, but just because you're frustrated or a populist does not mean you're right wing or racist. It just means you're maybe frustrated. Uh, America has a history of populism in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, we actually had a, a populist party uh, several versions of populist party, and they had a candidate for president who uh, did didn't win, but did fairly well, especially in the Midwest where I am from. So, uh, populism is, is nothing new, and it I would also say it is on the rise around the world. I, I think there are people in China, you know, billion people in China, and I think there's a, a group of folks in China that also are angry and frustrated with their lives and with their government. I've, I've lived in China and I've, I've heard these things and you see it, you can see it in the media as well, the media report. So, um, you know, there's nothing new about po uh, populism in this world and um, I, I don't, you could choose to see it as a negative thing. I just choose to see, uh, as I see this as a human condition, that there are people in this world that are not happy with what they have and not happy about the future. And. Uh, it can be thought of negative, it can be thought of as neutral. I just kind of try and look at it uh, from a scientific point of view. So Trump and Sanders both have tapped into this feeling of frustration. It's probably one of the biggest, it's not exactly an issue, it's not exactly a social movement, but it's one of the biggest feelings in America in recent years across the board, left, right, center, uh, but mostly from working class and middle class Americans is this feeling of uh, frustration and disappointment, uh, maybe about their own lives, but they especially focus this anger and frustration and disappointment on Washington, D.C., anything to do with Washington. Of course, the politicians get the most blame, also the bureaucrats, uh, the lobbyists, but also the, the what we call the mainstream media or the uh, the, the, the media in, in Washington, this, this small city of a few million people. They just all hang out together. They're having great lives. They have wonderful restaurants. They make big salaries, but they really only talk to one another and listen to one another. And they, they think they represent all opinions. And, you know, if you think about it, Washington is 3 million people. Uh, America is 300 million people. Uh, to me, that's 1% and the other 99%. So um, th there is a feeling in, in Americans that they're, that they're not being listened to. And uh, you know, the European version, I have a, I've been in Germany many times, and I have a number of German friends that are moderate centrist people, just like you. Uh, they have worries about some of this immigration going on in their country, and they feel like they can't say anything. Because in Germany, if you speak against immigration, you're labeled as a neo-Nazi. And these, my friends aren't neo-Nazis, they're just centrist Germans, but they, they can't say anything. And it's funny, because you find Americans in, 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 that feel the same way. If you uh, say the wrong opinion, you're called a racist or a, a something like this, or you're against other folks. And most Americans are, are fairly egalitarian. We don't care where you come from, we just care where you're going and you know how you present yourself. If you're paying taxes and speaking English and trying to fit in and work, then we accept you. So uh, there's a, a bit of frustration with being labeled as racist or Nazi or all these crazy things uh, when you're really not. But Trump and Sanders have both tapped into populism. Obviously, Sanders is getting more of the liberal left uh, folks that feel uh, frustration, and Trump is tapping in more into the uh, folks that are a bit center, or right of center, uh, that are feeling left out. And uh, we'll, we'll see, but, but it is a commonly held belief across America. If you did an opinion poll, if you drove across America on a car and every day you stopped in four places and asked 10 people, you know, do you like what's going on in Washington, yes or no? Uh, you'd get 80 or 90 percent that would say, no, I don't like what's going on in Washington. If you ask them the second question, do you feel lucky to be an American? 90% of them would say, yes, I'm glad I'm an American. So it's not disappointment so much in the overall country or system, but it's frustration with, uh, they'll always blame it on, Americans want to have someone to blame, and they always blame it on politicians in general, and this year they especially blame it on Washington. Uh, let me ask you today about the um, possible 
foreign policy by President Trump if he becomes president, obviously. Because the difference is that we know a lot about Hillary Clinton. And we know what to expect. If, if we support her, don't support her, we know what to expect. With Trump, not so much. And I wonder if you could tell us what will happen if Donald Trump wins in November. Yeah. What's the new foreign policy of the US? Uh, thanks for this. Um, I'm not so sure that, um, what, we, what, what we can expect from Clinton if she does win in some ways. But um, let, me, let me go back to the question about Trump. I mean, Trump has given um, some pretty tough comments about NATO. And uh, some of these comments, um, one is the threat that America will walk away from the alliance. Well, it won't because the alliance is in everybody's interest. Firstly, but secondly, actually, what he says about NATO, uh, about the Europeans, is actually right. That the Europeans haven't pulled their weight for security and defence. The Europeans haven't actually stepped up to the plate in terms of burden sharing. And how many uh, sec uh, Secretary of Defences in the US have said to the, the, the Europeans, "Look, you're prosperous, you're well off, you're stable, you're secure. Uh, we looked after. We we will continue providing the security uh, guarantee. There's no question about that." But you must help us too. And I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure Trump will articulate it like this. He's, and actually once anybody gets in power, remember how the, how the Europeans ridiculed Reagan and look at the work, the foreign policy that, that Reagan pursued. Um, so I, I, if Trump wins, it's going to be a, a very, um, it's going to be very um, unpredictable the first year. It depends on his team. It depends who's in the Pentagon. It depends on his national security advisor. It depends on who's going to run the State Department. And, and it depends on himself as well, what sort of America, American foreign policy he wants to have. This is the first thing. And, and secondly, just to round this off, the Europeans will have to think in strategic and foreign policy terms. And we are not because we're still waiting to see the outcome of the British vote, the global policy strategy that um, the, that's the EU foreign, foreign policy leader, Mogherini, she's been trying to drop this for a year now. We're sitting on it and, well, should we release it before or after? They're going to release it after the Brexit referendum. And um, we don't have a, a long-term policy towards the Balkans even. This is, this is our backyard and the Americans are extremely worried what's happening there. But we have been there pouring in billions and we still can't manage this. So essentially, my view is that no matter who wins in Washington, the pressure by Washington should increase on the Europeans to actually have a very coherent security and foreign policy, regardless of all these issues of populism. We can't blame populism and the elites in Brussels or the political elites at home not to act. Um, zaraz oddam panu dyrektorowi głos, ale mam pytanie z sali. Bardzo panią proszę. My name is Anna Murdoch. I'm an independent scholar. I have a question, a comment on Chris's uh, statement. Um, yes, I'm very interested in what you said about pe people being frustrated at being called fascist or nationalist. And, and maybe just, you know, my comment about this. Is it possible that Trump's take on immigration and blaming immigrants for all sorts of evils that are facing or have faced America, maybe a reaction to the extreme version of political correctness that has been going on for a long time. And what do you think about that? I, I think there is, in, in the US, there's a little too much political correctness. Um, and, and there is a bit of a pushback. People are kind of tired of this. I have friends that are black. All of my black, in, in the US, all my black friends call themselves black. They don't say African American. That's kind of this very, it started 20 years ago, it's this kind of very liberal, kind of a polit well, politically correct idea. And it's, most of my black friends say that they're black. So why do we have to, I, you know, I could demand to be called a Swiss American or a Caucasian American, and I'm just, I'm just a white guy. Uh, so, and, you know, now we have, we've evolved from African American, which is really kind of old, all the way to uh, gender neutrality. You get to declare if you're a man or a woman and what bathroom you use. And a lot of Americans, they just, they just don't see this as practical to, uh, that everyone has to be, get some special name uh, assigned to you. When most of us, we, you know, we're just, we're just Americans. And a whole bunch of people don't, don't really care, but there are a few that do. So I, I do think part of Trump's appeal, there's just, it's, there's this just kind of a big anti, 
every, not anti-everything, but a, a wave of sentiment across the U.S. that's just kind of tired of having uh, a lot of ideas that they either don't agree with or just don't care about, but nonetheless they're being jammed down your throat. And that's part of what Trump and, Trump and Sanders are both, but Trump getting more the, uh, uh, you know, the, the more conservative and uh, even some centrist folk that, that feel that way. Does that answer your question? Um, so let me switch back to the foreign policy because I think this is this is the most important impact that the U.S. elections can have on Europe and on Poland. And I wonder, you director, if you if uh, what's your take on Trump's foreign policy? And there there are rumors about Trump's team, and there are some names being mentioned. Richard Haas being one of the candidates for the Secretary of State in the Trump administration. I wonder if you could comment on this. Well, if it was Richard Haas, then I would be, uh, I, I would sleep well, right? But uh, uh, it's, Richard Haas is a very measured Republican, old school, and uh, um, very reasonable and um, non-partisan, really, uh, um, scholar. Uh, but I mean, but people who have been involved in uh, Trump's campaign on the foreign policy side are uh, far less measured than, than himself. And I, I don't quite recall the names right now, but there have been people who uh, have been uh, advocating uh, um, reapproachment with Putin. Uh, they have been, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, closing borders, you know, to um, uh, any refugees of any sort, uh, um, concentrating on pulling out of NAFTA and, and so on. And, uh, well, um, I'm not quite sure that I have sufficient confidence in Trump, in what I have heard from Trump, that he would do what George W. Bush did, yeah? But he has chosen a, a, a team of uh, safe hands uh, foreign policy people. Uh, at the time we thought they were radical, but now we see they were uh, they were not. Yeah, they were really uh, professional, uh, safe hand. Um, uh, you know, uh, good foreign policy scholars. Uh, Trump is prone to um, unexpected decisions and looking for what what a populist. Uh, trend may take him, uh, and uh, and and that's why you know I I think we are here in in uncharted waters. Um, so on foreign policy, I think what you need to know uh, bigger than Trump or Clinton is, you know, the two American political parties, the Democrats and Republicans, domestic policy versus foreign policy. On domestic policy. You know, funding of education, health care, uh, immigration, uh, many, many, many things. On domestic policy, the two political parties fight, fight, fight. They, they have many le legitimate disagreements, okay, and there are many differences. But if you look at history on foreign policy, despite what they say during the election, on foreign policy after the election, it doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican, it's going to be about 95% the same. I mean, you, you know, the best interests for the United States are almost exactly the same whether you're a Democrat or Republican. As we want to be number one, we want economic growth, uh, we like having allies and friends, we know there are enemies out there, but you know, maybe some of the, they take little different angles, but the foreign policy will be 95% the same no matter who wins. Um, and this is you know, kind of throughout history. I, a second thing, uh, NATO, uh, despite Trump's comments, the U.S. Is, will stay firmly committed to NATO. I have no doubt about that. Um, it, you know, we like it. We're accustomed to it. I, I never hear any American people complain about NATO. Uh, there's no reason to leave. We have advantages to stay. They're, NATO are our friends, and it's a way for us to exert influence in the world. And if we want to be number one, we need to be able to exert influence. So uh, the, the U.S., Trump or Clinton, will stay with NATO. Um, and, you know, in, in the longer, uh, there is a feeling amongst the American people, however, um, 
you know, a bit of fatigue about being the world's policeman. I think the U.S. remains committed to being the role of the world's policeman. We are tired of 10 or 15 years, or I can't remember how many years we've been involved in Iraq and Afghanistan, or iraq Afghanistan, as I like to call it. But there is a sense of fatigue that we've lost 10,000 soldiers, we spent $10 trillion, and it's still chaos in that region. You know, arguably it's worse than it was 20 years ago. And uh, in fact, I would say it, it is worse. And I think all the Iraqis and Afghanis and Libyans and Syrians would all agree that our, our, their, their, their region is a much more unstable place now. And that's unfortunate, uh, but it's something we all have to manage through. So the American people are tired of our involvement over there. The common saying is, yeah, we've spent 15 years and $10 trillion and it's worse and all of those people hate us. That's the common feeling. Uh, but. Nonetheless, I, th I think the U.S. will stick with it. We, we know this is part of our role. Uh, we realize that the Middle East has not turned out very well. Uh, I, I do think, you know, the, the eastern border of this country with Russia is a different story. I, you know, I think that uh, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Hungary, they're all members of the EU and they're all members of NATO. And I, you know, maybe Vladimir Putin wants some of your territory, but he's not going to take it. Ukraine was a very unfortunate victim. Uh, I, I don't see that changing back anytime soon. They, they were just too far away to help. And they weren't members of NATO or the EU, and I don't see that turning around anytime for probably 10 more years at least. But uh, I, I guess I'd just like to offer an uh, idea of assurance that the U.S. will stick with NATO. The foreign policy will be mostly the same no matter who wins. Judy, I, want, I know you want to comment, but uh, just one more question. Yeah, go ahead and ask. I wanted to ask you, Chris, but um, you say uh, I, it, it, the fatigue aspect is very strong, and and the fatigue also being the world's policeman, are, and you, then you say, but you know, um, the, America wants to remain the number one. But aren't there more competitors out there now? Over the past ten, we've seen the role of China, and we've seen. Uh, you didn't bring this up in the foreign policy issue, but the Obama administration has made this shift towards Asia. I mean, will this continue? And isn't the U.S. now facing very different challenges, particularly what's happening in the Middle East, which will continue for a long time yet, and and, and China? Well, um, the top two foreign policy issues, in my opinion, I, I should say. Uh, even though I'm here sponsored by the state, the people at the U.S. Embassy and the State Department, thank you, uh, I do not speak officially for them, I just speak my own opinion. So I would say for the Americans, the next 10 years, maybe longer, the top two issues are dealing with China and dealing with terrorism. You know, the U.S. has never had a competitor like the Chinese. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, well, Second World War so long ago, it doesn't matter, but during the Cold War, you know, the Russians, the U Soviet Union had a huge military, it's like a, a man with huge muscles in his arm, but he has tiny legs. You know, the Soviet economy was always, t even 1960s, 70s, and 80s, big military, small economy. I mean, if you think about it, what, what cars do the Russians sell around the world? Nothing. How many mobile phones do the Russians sell around the world? Nothing. How many televisions? How many, anything do they sell around? Nothing. It's because they don't, they produce very little. They have a, they, they still have today. Despite all the bluster, they have a weak economy. But so, we didn't know about. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but you didn't know about the weak economy of the well, Soviet Union. I, Everybody thought that the Soviet economy is very strong. So we know it now. We know now that the legs of the Soviet <laughs> Union are, were so small, but we didn't know it back in the 60s or 70s. I think probably some of, some of our, our analysts who studied the Soviet Union back in those days, they figured it. The common belief for most of us thought was that we might have nuclear war with these guys. But anyway, it's behind us now, and I, I see Russia the same way. You know, they, they relied on selling oil, exporting oil and gas and a few raw materials. The price of oil has plummeted. We all know this. It's not going to come back in. There's so much oil in the world. The, the price of oil is not going to go sky high for many years. So I don't see the Russians, you know, yes, they can be involved in Syria. Yes, they can grab uh, Crimea, but they just don't have the money to carry this big military or try and invade Poland. They, I, they can't afford it. So uh, they may have the desire to have a greater Russia, but I, I don't see that they have the economy to carry it, uh, you know, try and start much larger military operations than they're doing now. Obviously, they're doing a lot of disinformation and trying to, you know, throw hot water on other people, but uh, outright military assault on NATO, I don't see it happening. 
So you are not afraid of, of a huge shift uh, in, but, in, in, but, in but Trump China. foreign policy? If, but, if in a sh I mean a shift that we wouldn't expect from any other candidates or... Yeah, just expect that the Americans for the next some years will be focusing more on China. We, we've never had a competitor as big as China. I've been in China, they work hard, they value education, uh, you know, they've got this whole, I call it the hybrid, the next generation of capitalism. The British were the first generation, the Americans were the second generation of global capitalism, the Chinese are the next iteration. And they've got a whole new model and there's, you know, three times, almost four times as many Chinese people as there are Americans. And uh, they're, they're a force to be reckoned with and they're, they're not going away, they're not going to fall apart. Their economy is going slower, but for the Americans, we need to learn how to play football with these guys and, and win. And then the second one is global terrorism, uh, or it's really not global, but it's, shall we say, fundamentalist uh, Muslim terrorism or Islamists. Uh, that is its own separate issue that's, you know, I, I don't know that we exactly win, but we have to manage this somehow. So those were, I, in my opinion, will be our top foreign policy issues probably for the next decade. And we're not turning away from Europe, it's just that we need to pay attention to these other threats and competitors. Andrzej Kopczyński. Two more questions. Andrzej Kopczyński. If um, Trump, after winning the elections, if he does uh, topple his own ideas of foreign policy, is there any power in the US, any group that could withhold him or stop him? Because I heard that the Supreme Court could uh, somehow prevent his decisions from becoming effective, but what would happen then? Would that be total stagnation? Uh, well, you ask a good question and you've already answered it. Our American Constitution from 1776 uh, establishes a three-way uh, three balance in our government. The executive branch, which is the president, the legislative branch, which is the Congress, and the judicial branch. And it's, it's designed that way so that we can never be taken over by a dictator or a king. And it is certainly true that our president is, you know, arguably a very powerful person, especially on the use of the military, but there is a check and balance system. And I, I don't see Trump doing anything particularly radical. You know, never forget, I, I, I guess I don't know Polish politicians and campaigns, but, but I do know American politicians and, and elections. And uh, the, the American people are a bit cynical in that we, many of them say, politicians say one thing during the election when they want your vote, and when they're in Washington or the state capitol, they do the opposite. And so I think Trump is saying things, number one, because he's not a very practiced candidate, but also he's saying things that are inflammatory uh, to get votes. And I suspect by the time, uh, if he should win, that uh, he will ultimately get some good people to surround himself with as ministers and advisors. And so I don't think he would be as rash uh, or quick to shoot uh, as he may sound today during the election. But he, he can still get very radical in foreign policy because in foreign policy uh, there are not so many checks and balances and the president is basically free to do whatever, almost whatever yes. he wants. It is true within our constitution on issues of foreign policy and command of the military, the president does have much more authority to act on his own. However, it's always all presidents have always worked in consultation with Congress and certainly with their advisors. And I think if Trump wins, uh, you know, maybe he won't, but if he should win, uh, I do think he's a, he's a person who's accustomed to making large decisions. If you look at his life, he obviously is a billionaire. Uh, he inherited a lot of money and made it into even more money. But um, he is accustomed to looking at not, not so much buying groceries, but he's accustomed to making big deals, negotiating large real estate deals, but nonetheless, he is accustomed to working with very powerful people, and he is accustomed to negotiating at a high level, uh, certainly real estate business deals, but I, I think he probably has the mental faculty to negotiate at a higher level with a, another head of state, especially if he has good advisors. And what a after making all these promises to the electorate, what if he doesn't deliver? 
know. But once again, well, he won't. That, that's for sure. Exactly. That's yeah. And neither will Hillary. Right. Neither does any politician. Yeah. This is what American people. <laughs> Not think. like in Poland. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. You yes. say all these things, you make all these promises, and then you never do it. That's what Americans think about all politicians of both parties. They've thought this for many, many years. You make promises and you don't keep them. You say you're going to do this, but you don't do it. You get elected, and then you go to Washington, and then you become a different person. The American people have said this for a long time about all the politicians. But, but Chris, this this campaign is different though because it's 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 changing the rules of the game in the in the discourse and in the promises and in the kind of um, n n not the populist but the kind of wave of of different uh, supporters that are now going to Sanders and um, and Trump. So to go to the White House and then just forget them. It's actually not only betraying everything you stood for during the campaign, but actually you're, you're actually returning to the establishment that actually you challenged in the first place. So how is, how is Trump going to square that circle? Yeah. What well, is very difficult, the uh, Washington, D.C. Is, is, you know, the, 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 the government, the bureaucracy, the special interest groups, it is a leviathan, enormous machine that is almost impossible for any person to change. Even if we created a, a, a dictatorship, you know, with no judiciary and no Congress, it would still be difficult to change. There, there's the, the bureaucracy, the lobby groups, they have such, um, I shouldn't say energy, but they keep rolling forward. It's, I, I told a student yesterday, uh, even if it was a dictator, it would be like walking outside to pick up a, an apartment building and turn the apartment building to face another direction. To change Washington and, and what's going on, the laws, the policies, the inertia, inertia would be the word, uh, is very difficult for anyone. Doesn't matter if it's Hillary or Donald, it'll be difficult to change things. There's so many, you know, there are a lot of people in Washington, it's true, maybe 90, or many, the major, vast majority of Americans who don't live in Washington are frustrated and angry, but there are a lot of people in Washington who like things just the way they are because they're making a lot of money. They don't want change. This is true of lobby groups, it's true of many. They make a lot of money, they make higher salaries, bigger money, keeping things the way they are. So uh, that's part of why it's hard to change is there's folks fighting change, fighting the reforms. So. Pani, bardzo proszę. Uh, we have a question from the audience. My name is Marzena Rzek uh, National Defense University of Warsaw. Um, so my question is, I would like to switch a little bit from the uh, evaluation of program of Donald Trump and ask you to make a quick review and review of the program of Donald Trump, his campaign, as well of campaign of Hillary Clinton. Because in my view, uh, either Hillary Clinton campaign some way is controversial and Donald Trump as well. And I would like to ask you to point, in your opinion, some fact or some issue which you disagree, how both of these candidates present, and point the issue which can have great or main value for the future, for develop the future way of present the economy and political strength of United States. Thank you. Panie dyrektorze, chciałby pan Yeah, well, I think when it comes to the program of Hillary Clinton, this is, especially when it's about foreign foreign security policy, it has been well articulated, and we know the, uh, the, the we we know the key highlights. There was a speech that she delivered on the issue where she pledged. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, and engage America, and America would, would be, we should stay involved with world affairs. And, um, you know, from my point of view, as from point of view of anything in Ankara, I believe this, this is the essential thing, that, that we want the U.S. that is actually not focused on um, itself and its domestic issues, uh, but, uh, but, but it's an, uh, we want America which is involved in the world. So I don't have any major issues, frankly, with that, that I could pick up on and, and criticize here. But, uh, you know, the, the, the speeches are just speeches. Um, 
at the same time, Donald Trump still uh, needs to do this kind of a, uh, pronouncement when he tells the world what his foreign policy would be like. So far, we have only uh, heard the snippets of, of, of um, uh, you know, populism, really, um, um, you know, calling judges uh, uh, of Supreme Court Mexicans and and uh, uh, and you know promising to close borders, uh, stopping immigration, uh, considering withdrawing from NATO, uh, and I, I'm reassured by what Senator Steinegger is telling us that this is all just politics and it's not being serious. I hope it's is the case, and uh, indeed, if as Bartosz is saying. Uh, um, Richard Haas would consider uh, taking position in his administration, that would be very reassuring. Uh, and if that happens, and if he has a real power, because that's another thing, that he could just be a, a fig leaf, you know, looking nice to the world, but with no real uh, competence, no real power. But if Richard Haas was to have a real power, then uh, indeed I would believe that uh, we are only in the electioneering period, uh, and uh, then we will get back to the world of sanity. Uh, but we are not in that now, I'm afraid. Um, so things I disagree and agree, or maybe with both parties. Um, with the Dem one of the main reasons I left the Democrat Party and became a Republican is I just don't I believe anymore. I, when I was younger, I was very liberal. In fact, I was like social Democrat type person when I was a, in, a university student. And then I was just liberal and then conservative Democrat, but, and then now Republican. But uh, I don't believe that the government can solve all problems for Americans, let alone all of the world. I, I believe in a amount of self-initiative. Uh, I, I believe in less regulation. There are too many regulations uh, on business in America, especially small business. So these are issues I disagree with the uh, Democrat party. Uh, I especially disagree with the Democrats on the issue of social welfare, you know, in in the U.S. versus as opposed to Europe, Europe, I think you tend to include in the definitions of social welfare, uh, retirement, pensions, and also health insurance. In Americans, those are separate issues to, uh, for us. We define social welfare as you know poor people who can't manage themselves, and they live. Uh, the government gives them apartment and food and some money every every month. And this is where I, I completely disagree with the Democrats because I think we've created this huge uh, five generations now of people that have no idea how to manage their lives and we just subsidize them to you know have more babies and start it all over again. So that's, that's some of the things I disagree with the Democrats in general. Um, uh, some of the things I disagree with the Republicans, including Trump, I'm a Republican, I'm fairly conservative, uh, but America has always been a nation of immigrants. I mean, my people came from Switzerland. Uh, in my own hometown, Kansas City, we have a neighborhood called Polish Hill because Poles came there in the 1890s and built a Polish Catholic church and they still have a Polsky Day parade every year that I go to. So uh, America's been built and made by and for people from all around the world. Uh, however, today we just want people to come legally. Don't come illegally and stay. Uh, you know, so I disagree with Trump uh, on being harsh on the immigrants. Right now, in my hometown, Kansas City, I, I see these guys, These most of our immigrants in the U.S. are from Mexico or South America. They are Spanish speaking, they're of, you know, more a Catholic orientation, uh, but they come for the same reasons my great-great-grandfather came to America. They come for opportunity. They come for an opportunity to make their life better. In Mexico, they work all day, they get $5. In Kansas City, they work one hour and they get $15. So, you know, it's an easy thing. It's, you know, it's a better life for them. So I, we just want them to come legally. And I think that's the real issue for uh, one of the big issues in the next, uh, next, this election is how do we solve the immigration issue. But it's something I disagree with Trump uh, and many Republicans I, I favor. Uh, we, you know, we, we have about estimated 10 to 12 million illegal immigrants in the U.S. right now. The, no one knows exactly how many of those are the estimates. And a few extreme Republicans want to round these guys all up, 10 million people, round them all up somehow, I don't know how, and send them back to Mexico. 
but that's, it's impossible. Number one, it's physically impossible. But, you know, my view is these people work hard and they do work that Americans don't want to do. So I, I favor a, we could say a path towards a green card. A green card does not make them uh, citizens, but it gives them legal status to stay in the country and work. And I, so this is something I, I disagree with uh, many Republicans, especially Trump. And uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Judy? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, very briefly, I, I want to bring back um, the issue of the implications of a Trump victory for Europe, uh, regardless of his team or whatever. If Donald Trump wins, it will be a huge fillip for Marine Le Pen in France and for other uh, populist movements and, political, um, and, and populist leaders throughout Europe. And I think this is the, it's, it's the, it's the message that, um, that he will send to Europe, Chris. That's the worrying aspect, and that it will be exploited by movements who believe that they can go out, make these promises, and, um, and hopefully then, uh, in, their, in their hope, get power. The problem is that the special kind of liberal democratic order that built up after 1945 and that the Americans helped to build the European Union and helped to, to rebuild Europe, this actually could be endangered, this very special alliance. I'm not talking about the NATO alliance. I'm talking about this very special Western liberal democratic alliance, which has been the beacon and the attraction to civil society movements and pro-democratic movements outside Europe and outside America. That's my worry about a Trump victory. Proszę bardzo, tak pan w piątym rzędzie, bardzo proszę, a potem pan... And now uh, there's another question from the audience. Morozowski, uh, actually, Judy, you, you said what I wanted to, to, to say and uh, to ask if uh, actually um, this is not the most important thing because, uh, Chris, you said uh, you think the two priorities in foreign policy for Trump would be China and, and terrorism. But, but And also you said um, that from Russia we don't have today this military uh, danger of, of, you know, military aggression on a NATO, NATO member, which is, of course, uh, right. But um, I think today... The the danger is not only in military invasion. It's there are also in other ways of you know hybrid wars and and uh, and other ways of maybe not uh, leading a war but uh, trying to disintegrate maybe the the Western the whole Western project and so on that we also talked about yesterday in the first panel uh, with Judy. So um, don't you think this is the biggest danger actually today if Trump gets elected? I mean. Um, after what he's saying in his campaign, of course, because if he, like you said, uh, continues in 95% the foreign policy of United States uh, after get, getting elected, maybe this would be, wouldn't be the danger. But uh, if he doesn't, if he does the things he says during the campaign in foreign policy, which for me are war, uh, can be worry for, uh, for us here in Europe, isn't that the biggest danger maybe? Um. I'm, I'm thinking the response. Um, for the, uh, I'm going to take a little umbrage with your conclusion that you think that only this kind of liberal, Americans have a different v definition of liberal than in Europe, that this kind of liberal left thing that's been going on for 40 or 50 years is the only way. And if we don't stick with this, the world will end. And I, I, I'm a little not insulted, but I take umbrage with that. You know what, maybe other people, there's, there's five billion people on this earth. Maybe other people have good ideas, not just your way. Give us a chance. Maybe being a bit center instead of always liberal left, maybe we can also do well. I wasn't maybe we won't ruin the world. Okay, it's, it's Chris, probably I won't happen. Meaning, I, I, I see now you're interrupting again. I wasn't meaning the liberal in, in your sense of it. The values of democracy, the values of human dignity, the, those old traditional values that have binded the Europeans and the Americans, okay. of the divisibility of power, the checks and balances. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, another thing that really annoys Americans is that are not, it doesn't mean you're right, it's just if you're not part of the real liberal establishment, they just interrupt. They just don't even let you speak. They won't even listen. Sorry, but it's an example. You just interrupted. You didn't even listen to what I had to say. And this, it's not just me, but many Americans feel like they won't even listen to us anymore. They just, they just disregard what we have to say. 
even Germans, my German friends feel the same way. They're centrist Germans, but they just get interrupted. You can't even question the immigrants. Oh, you're a Nazi. You're going to destroy the world. Well, no, we're not. We're not going to destroy the world. We're not going to end democracy. We're not going to end free elections. We just maybe think there's a better way. You could call it the third way, a better way. That you don't always have to do everything in the old-fashioned liberal left. You know, we're all kumbaya. There's an, another better way to do things. And I, you know, one of the reasons I left the Democrats is, to me, policy. Well, it's foreign policy, domestic policy. There's always a, there's, you know, it's always a better way. Americans were very innovative, creative people. We always believe there's a better way to do anything, a better way to build a car, a better way to have a telephone. You know, the old telephones you had to dial, later you had to push a button, now we have mobile phones. You got Americans think, I think this way about policy. I think there's always a better way to make policy and make, make new government policy that's better. Just because you're changing what's been going, it doesn't mean it's gonna go bad, it just maybe you're changing and be better. You know, I have an iPhone, I had an iPhone 1, now I have an iPhone 4, then I have iPhone 5. I didn't, when I changed iPhones, I didn't think, oh, this is gonna be terrible, I'm giving up my old phone that I've had three years, I thought, no, it'll be better, the new idea is better than the old one, it's an improvement. And I feel the same way about policy. It's one of the reasons I left the Democrats, they were so, I called them, I would tease them, you're stuck in the 1970s. You can't think of a new idea. You keep trying to fund, keep these old programs that don't work very well. You won't reform, you won't improve. You're stuck in the 70s. Try a new idea. There's always a better way. This is kind of American thinking. There's always a better way. You can't change the past. You can only go forward. There's always a better way in the future. You just have to use your mind. And this is how I feel about uh, you know Republicans and conservatives, whether they're in the US or in Europe. I, you know, I, I don't know this Marie Le Pen. I've heard of her. I, I've heard of this Pegeta movement in Germany. Germany. Uh, I, I really doubt all these people are a bunch of racist Nazis, maybe some of them, but not all of them. Maybe they just want to try something a little bit different. Maybe, maybe it might be an improvement. So this is kind of how I feel. I, I don't think the election of Donald Trump is going to end the transatlantic relationship. It's not. It's still going to be great. You know, the, the relations between America and Europe are very deep. They go way beyond politicians. You know, we, we like to, it's not a joke, it's the truth. If you're an American with Caucasian skin, you know, you, you're de de descended from people in Europe. Mine is from Switzerland. There are many Polish Americans, but you know, you are our cousins. We're not, you know, we're not gonna turn our backs on our cousins and our friends and our allies. We like you. And just, if Trump gets elected, we're not gonna walk away, we're not gonna give up on NATO, it doesn't mean a right-wing takeover, it doesn't mean the end of your voting rights or your freedom, it doesn't mean any of those things. Those are crazy exaggerations. I think, you know, the world keeps going mostly in the same, you know, things don't change quickly in politics, and I, I don't think this means the end of the world if Donald Trump gets elected. The odds are he probably won't get elected anyway, but if he does, it's not the end of, bardzo proszę pan, proszę bardzo. Tomasz Rutkowski. Uh, uh, I was there last. Uh, in this debate, we focus on only criticize Donald Trump. I don't support them, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe we talk about something which is not exist. What is not not exist because uh, every candidate have no complex program for foreign policy, uh, American foreign policy. Uh, they have no idea for them. We didn't talk about uh, Bernie Sanders in this debate, uh, which is still the um, the candidate who uh, who can win in uh, in the Democratic Party. Uh, so this Bernie Sanders is only one candidate from these three mainly candidates who talk about global warming, who talk about hunger in Europe, who talk about TTIP. What is with with TTIP, which uh, is for me uh, the um, the treaty who can uh, change Europe, change America, because it's a very very big, uh, very big uh, uh, international treaty between the two powerful economics. Thank you, Director. Sir, would you like to comment on uh, Bernie Sanders? And I just want to mention that Donald Trump did mention TTIP. And uh, Hillary Clinton didn't talk about this, but Trump did, and he said that he didn't want it. Well, I, I think it's a very good question. I mean, in a sense, I mean, the, um, yes, it would be nice to uh, to have a, a debate about, you know, uh, both potential candidates 
uh, and, and we, but, but you know, but Trump is such an unusual uh, candidate. The times are so unusual uh, that this is this is why uh, uh, the attention is on it. As for Bernie Sanders, I mean, I. I I don't believe that he uh, he is electable at this point in time. I don't. Th I just don't think he's got the numbers there. Uh, so. No, 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 no. But I mean, in in a sense that his chances to get the to the Donald Trump has pretty much secured uh, uh, the uh, nomination, and I think that the nomination for Sanders at this point in time, in terms of the votes and numbers that he would need to get, is such that it's very unlikely he could stay in the race. Uh, and the senator maybe can confirm it and uh, or or not. But I think that uh, Sanders is just no longer. Uh, um, anything else than a sideshow at this point in time. Um, however, you have a point in by saying that you know with the fact that he stayed in the race so long, uh, even though he represents quite extreme views by American standards, is also telling us a lot. And in the course of our discussion here, we actually a number of times said that the Trump and Sanders phenomenon have something in common. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to bring up the liberal democracy thing because it's too difficult. One thing, um, I, the TTIP question is just so important because it's just not about trade. It has huge uh, geostrategic issues and, uh, and it's got a huge uh, geostrategic implication for the strength of, 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 the, of, the, Euro of the European and American transatlantic alliance. There's no doubt about this. What, now, my question, my question to, to Chris is that um, under pressure from Sanders, uh, Clinton actually rejected the, the Pacific Trade Pact that Obama pushed through. And under pressure from Sanders, she has moved more and more to the left, in fact. At the end of the day, whoever wins, do you think TTIP will survive? Really good question. Um, the American people, the average people, they're, obviously America has lost a lot of jobs overseas for 30 years now. We've been losing jobs first to Japan and then Mexico, now China. Many of these jobs were jobs of the working class and middle class. So it's been going on for 30 years. It's kind of accumulating this ang worry. I would use the word worry and, and frustration and anger. And uh, that's part of the, the many things that have fueled uh, Trump and Sanders. So there is pushback or desire from the American people to uh, somehow make, make the playing field, the football playing field, better for us again. And the victim will be these trade deals. And Sanders and Trump both get it. Trump thinks he can negotiate a better trade deal. And honestly, he, he, once again, he, he understands kind of high-level negotiation and macroeconomics. So I actually think he could do a better job maybe of negotiating trade deals. But I, I would say TTIP is in danger uh, with, with either one of them. Uh, the, the Democrats are probably or, the more kind of left part of our country, or left thinking part of our country is more demanding of trade reform. The trade, especially the labor unions, which are Democrat supporters generally, they're they're more skeptical of, of these global trade deals. You know, the right kind of half of the country uh, is a bit more pro-business, and the business, the large, the big business community, and ag. I'm from an ag state. Agriculture interests want TTIP. They want global trade. You know, America is a huge exporter of global uh, of agricultural products. So where I'm from, people generally kind of want the trade deals. Uh, but so I think the Republicans would be a bit more likely to work on TTIP. The Democrats will be on pressure just to, to stop it completely. Bardzo proszę, pani. Uh, I would like to first a short comment on if Democrats are stuck in the 70s. Wasn't that a Democrat who changed social security, defunded it basically, who deregulated Wall Street, and who changed the prison system? Uh, so that's this. And second, I would like to get back a little bit to the Trump phenomena, because we heard all the usual suspects that it's because of the media or social media, so basically too much democracy. It's because of uh, racism or, or because of uh, too much political correctness. And how about uh, economic reasons? How about you know the, the po economical policy of last 30 years? 
Because what our Trump supporters most concerned about is not immigration, it's like second or third, it's jobs. And he's promising them to bring the jobs back. And third thing, because you mentioned, and of course, the American political system is check and balances, and it's a safeguard towards extremism. But doesn't also mean that if the system isn't functioning, and maybe I think you can risk the assessment that the system isn't functioning, people are voting Donald Trump. So it doesn't mean that it cannot be, you know, that this check and balance system is blocking any kind of reform? There was many questions in one question. Uh, so I'll try and answer your big question. Uh, you, you know, w once again, no particular president can solve all the problems. You know, America's competitiveness in the world will not be solved by our government, president, any, anybody could be president, or even the government itself. Uh, America's competitiveness will be solved by the American people. You know, that, that's, the only, that's our greatest strength is our people and our, and our innovation and our ingenuity and our creativity and the number of new products we do. That's how we're going to stay competitive. Not with or without Washington, America will survive through its people and its com our, our just innate desire to compete. We are a very competitive people. We like football, we like basketball, we like baseball, we like auto racing, we like anything that has competition. Not all of us are competitive. We have a huge group of folks that don't know how to do anything anymore, but um, we are, in generally speaking, a competitive, innovative nation. And I, I view it as, uh, that's, you can look to Washington or the President, Trump or Clinton, whoever, to help us, and they can help a little, but it's mostly gonna be solved by our own creativity and competitiveness, and, and, and that's, that's how we'll compete. I know that I didn't answer all, your, all of your questions, but it was many questions in one, so. Please have a follow-up if you need to. Uh, I'd like the, how you framed the question about the Democrats stuck in the 1970s. I think, Chris, the puzzle for the Europeans was that there wasn't compulsory health care, uh, health um, um, medical um, insurance mm -hmm. in the United States. And as Europeans, we thought this should be the most automatic aspect. So, I mean. Do, you, do, you, do the Republicans still oppose this, this compulsory health insurance scheme? And is it really saying that the Democrats were stuck in the 70s by actually pushing through that? Thank you. Yeah. Democrats stuck in the 70s, most of the ones that I worked with, and I was a party activist for 20 years. I worked on many, many uh, Democrat campaigns, and I was a Democrat state senator 10 years. Uh, 12, and you know, mo the, the basic mentality is the government is always correct. The government can do no wrong. Give more money to the government, more programs, more, you know, and and the Republicans at least question that model. They're not very good at, at reducing government or downsizing, but at least they officially question the size of government and they question programs. The Democrats never do. They just want more power, more money to the government. Um, that's why I think they're stuck in the 70s. But, uh, uh, and I, you know, I hope that further answers your question as well. But how about gentleman over here, just, just give me a second. Okay, I'll just, let me just ask a follow-up question and then the gentleman in the second row. Um, the Obamacare, the Chris, the- uh, Obamacare, uh, do you, sorry, do you think? healthcare. Let me, let me answer healthcare. Uh, let me ask you just a, a quick question and uh, let me push you in the direction of the answer. Uh, do you think it worked or do you think that if, if Trump becomes president, will, will Republicans revoke Obamacare? You're giving me such an easy question. Yeah, that's, that's a short one, yeah. The fundamental problem with health insurance or healthcare in the United States is it is too damn expensive. You guys, you in Europe, you spend half of what we do, yet you have universal health insurance. Everyone has health insurance in most of the EU countries, but you're spending half as much as we do. We spend twice as much GDP, we spend twice as much per person, we don't even have universal health insurance, and many of our people are less healthy. Shouldn't, and, and I used to, I, I, I studied, actually health, health insurance is my forte issue. I had an EU fellowship studying health insurance in Brussels. Thank you, EU citizens. You paid yeah. for me to visit Brussels. The problem, and, and as a Democrat, they just, no, nope, we have to give more money to Medicare, Medicaid, they, don't ask questions, just give more money. No, you're not allowed to question the system, give more money. And I thought, well, this system doesn't work very well. I want to ask questions. I want to know, is there a better way? And there is a better way. Uh, the problem with Obamacare is, 
it did not change the structure. It did not do really, in the, and despite 1,000 pages long bill, it didn't do anything to lower the cost of the system that we have. Instead, it mandated you must buy health insurance. It doesn't matter if you're poor or working class, you will buy this product. Whether you can afford it or not, you must buy health insurance. Obamacare did very little to lower the cost of this system. Our system is out of control. There are many, many people getting very rich off of providing health care in America. Insurance companies, doctors, hospital administrators. In my own Kansas City, we have a nonprofit, nonprofit hospital owned by the state. The director, $500,000 a year. That's his salary. But it's a non-profit. It gets treated as a non-profit state. 500000 a year is this guy. And his number two guy gets paid 400000 a year. Plus, they have expense account. You know, there's a lot of... The insurance companies also, they make a lot of money. The doctors make a lot of money. In merry old England, I, I did a comparison of English doctors or uh, Great Britain doctors, the UK, versus ours. Our doctors get twice as much money for doing the same work. I'm not sure about Polish doctors. The German doctors are paid <laughs> half or less. All you guys in Europe, you, you, you've been, in a way, smarter, is that you've kept the cost down so you can afford universal health insurance. In America, until we solve this, until we you know, squeeze the money out of it, then, then someday we can afford it. And there's ways to do it. I am a Republican. I do favor the goal of every American citizen having basic health insurance. Uh, and I believe there is a way using more of a free market model to achieve that goal. But we really don't have a free market in health insurance in America. Some Americans, if you're old, <coughs> you get Medicare. It's a government program. If you're poor, you get something called Medicaid. If you're a member of the military, you get the Veterans Administration health care. And if you're not old, poor, or military, you're on your own. And now you're under Obamacare. You're mandated to buy into the system that's really evil. Your mandate, Obamacare mandates us to buy health insurance in an evil system. If you're old, you're okay. If you're really poor or military, the government takes care of you. So, uh, you know, the Steininger plan is we take all the government programs, put them together, and every American gets a voucher or coupon. And second, we mandate every insurance company must offer a basic health insurance plan that my voucher will buy. It's kind of, my idea is based on the German model. You force the insurance companies to compete, and then you put the citizen, and you give the citizen a coupon, and let them shop and compare prices and choose an insurance plan. So it, it makes it much more competitive for the industry, but also for the citizen. It gives us choices. Bardzo proszę pan w yeah. drugim uh, I'm Malik Arjunapa, professor from India. Uh, on a visiting basis to the University of Warsaw under Erasmus Mundus. The way I see Donald Trump's campaign is to appeal to the citizens, larger sentiments of the citizens. And uh, the media, the debate, looks to be hyping up the entire thing. Suppose he gets elected. What is the chance that he would implement the type of policies that he is advocating in the election campaign now. Do you think Donald Trump can afford to ignore the type of debate, ignore the sentiments of maybe the senators, uh, Republican senators, and also the larger sentiment of the American public? And also the debate around the world and go against the sentiment, large, larger sentiment, if he is elected as a president? And what are those chances that he would neglect all these things and then implement his policies to the detriment of larger citizens? Judy, would you like to answer this? No? Okay. okay. Yeah, because I think this this question has been asked, right, in uh, previously. You know, Trump. Um, it was somewhat easy to win the primary. There were the Republican primary had 15 people running for president. A very large, normally it's three or four running in any Democrat Republican primary, doesn't matter. There's usually three or four contenders. This time they had 15. There's an old political adage or saying, when, when you have a very crowded field, it's easy for one candidate to move forward. And uh, Trump has benefited from that. But that the primary is over. Now it's him versus Hillary. 
he does have up here uphill battle mainly because he's he's pissed off so many he said so many disparaging marks to uh, uh, about women and minority people he, he's really angered a lot of people so he's created for himself a difficult situation but he can win it's doable uh, but he'll have to get everything right uh, further more because he was such an anti, well, he wasn't even a politician, uh, you know, uh, outside the establishment, anti-establishment, whatever you want to call it, his initial core group of campaign advisors was very small. It's an amazingly small organization. He had really four or five people running his entire campaign until about a month or six, well, until a few months ago. You know, the Jeb Bush campaign probably had 100 people working, or maybe more. Hillary Clinton probably has several hundred people. Early on, Trump had, you know, enough people as sitting on the stage, and that was his circle. So it's amazing how, it, and on the one hand, it's amazing he's made it this far, but I can also see it. If the Republican field had maybe three people from the beginning, Trump probably would not have won. But he was able to outlast, all, in a crowded field, he was able to, the, 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 the votes were very divided. If there had only been one social conservative Republican, that, that guy would probably have won. But instead, there, there were several people, uh, several candidates dividing up the social conservative bloc. Same with the moderate Republicans. They had Chris Christie, they had Jeb Bush, they had John Kasich. They divided all the moderate vote. And Trump just was able to hang on to enough votes to emerge. You know, it's kind of, he, in a way, he got kind of very lucky, you might say. But um, nonetheless, I think on the chance that he is elected, and I, I'd give him a 45% chance right now, 45% chance for him, 55% chance for Hillary, something like this, maybe 48, 52 would be the odds uh, today if the election were tomorrow. Uh, but you know, I, I still come back to if, if he should win, I, I think already now he's starting, as he's now emerging as the Republican nominee, you know, a lot of people are starting to jump. You know, you, you may not see it in the newspapers. You saw Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House. He endorsed Trump a couple days ago. So bit by bit, uh, some of it very public and some of it very private, the, the, the Republicans will gather around Trump. And, you know, smart people will ask to be involved or be asked to be involved. Uh, as the ne as the next few months roll by, and and should he be elected, you know, I, I think he'll realize he's been handed something really big, and I, I think he'll calm down. Uh, you know, once again, I think the systems of checks and balances will kick in, the constitutional checks and balances, and the the uh, operative checks and balances are you have multiple, you know, two political parties, the parties have factions, you have the House and the Senate, you have to, you know, even negotiating bills or legislation through the House and the Senate is a nightmare. So he'll, he'll very rapidly run into the Washington mach gigantic machine that is, you know, impossible for anyone to control, and he'll, he'll be, let's just say his views or desires will be tempered or slowed down by the system. As we have the last five minutes of the debate, I want to ask Judy a, a simple and quick question. Let's imagine this is the end of 2017. Donald Trump is the president. Mr. Sarkozy is the president of France. UK voted for Brexit. Uh, the Eurozone is in disarray. The immigration crisis is on. Russia is doing what they're doing best, which is endangering the neighbors. How do you see the U.S.-European relations at, by, in the next two or three years in a scenario like this? Well, you left out, oh, sorry, you at least you left out Marine Le Pen winning. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot about Marine Le Pen. But, well, I think Sarkozy probably oh, Okay, and you left win. out the German yeah. elections. But Le Pen yeah, will probably yeah. be in the second round with So the, the question, with how do I see the future of the, the U.S.-EU uh, relations? Um, wobbly. I mean, Chris. I think NATO will. NATO is intact. There's no question about that. It's it's the linchpin of of the alliance. But uh, what we, you know, what's happening in Europe? There is a growing anti-Americanism, mm -hmm. and this is exemplified through the anti-TTIP lobby. And leaders across uh, Europe have not stood out in defence of. TTIP, as if they're afraid of it, to go on about oh, the, 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 the consumer elements. But TTIP has exposed, or the anti-TTIP has tapped into anti-Americanism. And I think this is going to be a very, very worrying trend, no matter who wins. And this will actually uh, temper or, or influence TTIP, and it'll influence 
um, it'll influence uh, sharing intelligence, security issues, dealing, having a common threat perception of, of particularly terrorism. And I think this is a big worry, this anti-Americanism. Would you like to comment on this? Um, um, I mean, just by simply saying that um, I, I think that, uh, you know, wobbly is the, um, um, is the right definition. Um, I, I think the relationship will, um, will get, uh, certainly will not improve um, uh, under the uh, circumstances that you have outlined, yeah, which uh, are not exactly to be ruled out. It can happen. Uh, all, all of that can happen. Uh, so, um, you know, we just have to brace ourselves for um, some stormy weathers in transatlantic relations. Uh, think uh, about, you know, fundamentals that unite us. Um, and, um, you know, let's just hope that this storm is going to pass over the next few years. Yeah. Um, but uh, then again, you know, it, it, the result could be very different. The, British voters on the 24th of uh, in two weeks times could uh, could could actually vote to stay in. Uh, polls are uh, suggesting that this is perhaps more likely now. Um, you know the U.S. elections, as Chris was saying, you know uh, are probably still likely to go uh, um, uh, Hillary's way. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, whichever way they go, I mean, there, I think that the, uh, we do have some underlying, you know, structural ways in transatlantic relations, which, uh, which are, uh, which, you know, Europeans need to wake up to that. Um, you know, the very fact that, that Donald Trump has tapped into this uh, rhetoric that NATO is too expensive for the United States and that Europeans have been free riders is real. You know, we are free riders. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is, this, is no, this is no escaping from this fact, you know, that, that, uh, that the American public is, is growing impatient and uh, disappointed with the fact that they have to, uh, you know, pay the bill for our security and defense. Uh, and the Europeans, you know, have to wake up to that fact. And I think on this optimistic note, we can end the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great question. Thank you. Thank the panelists.